Hi, I'm Jay McClellan with Ionia County Search and Rescue and Montcalm Ionia Citizen Corps. And this video is about using a map for search and rescue. So I'm going to be talking about parts of a map and the style of map that we use for search and rescue. And I'll spend a lot of time on the U.S. National Grid coordinate system that we use for search and rescue. And finally, I'll also talk about topographic features shown on a map and how to relate that to features on a landscape. When you're done with this course, you should understand the meaning of a map datum and why that's important to us. You should understand the U.S. National Grid coordinate system and the different parts of it. You should understand how we use different numbers of digits in specifying coordinates to relate a degree of precision in the location. You should be able to identify the parts of a map that we use for search and rescue, at least the most important ones. And you should be able to take a USNG coordinate and both go to a map and from a map. That is, you should be able to read USNG coordinates off of a map given a point, and you should be able to, given coordinates, find the corresponding point on a map. And finally, you should be able to identify the most important topographic features on a map, the ones that we might use to help navigation and understand what those mean when you're out in the woods and looking around, what are the topographic features that you see and how those relate to topography as it's depicted on a topographic map. So a map datum is an approximation of the shape of the Earth. It's a mathematical model that approximates the Earth's shape. The Earth is this big, lumpy, bumpy, kind of round thing, but it's not perfectly round. And you can see in my illustration on the live, greatly exaggerated how lumpy and bumpy it is. But it's not a perfect sphere by any means, and it's not even a perfect squashed sphere. So we use a mathematical model to approximate that shape in order to develop coordinate systems like the U.S. National Grid. Different mathematical models of the Earth have been developed over time, and different models will yield different coordinates for a given point. So it's very important when uh, relating coordinates on a map or on a GPS to know what the map datum is that's in use and make sure you use the same map datum between different uh, devices and different maps and so on. For search and rescue, there are two uh, that we use that are essentially interchangeable. Uh, the North American Datum 1983, NAD83, and the World Geodetic Survey 1984, or WGS84. For all practical purposes for us, they're the same. Strictly speaking, they're not 100% identical, but they're so close that essentially they're interchangeable, and you can use either one. Uh, we generally prefer NAD83 as the default, but WGS84 is fine. On older maps, you might find other, uh, another datum in use, such as NAD27, and that's substantially different than the newer ones. It doesn't mean you can't use the map, you just have to understand that the coordinates are different, and you may need to adjust your GPS, for example, to work in the datum of the map that you have. So here's uh, an illustration of the different datums uh, and relative to the Earth, and you can see, and, and again, I've exaggerated quite a bit, but because these two systems depict different mathematical shape, a given point on the Earth can be actually quite far away um, in, in terms of its coordinates from one datum to another. In search and rescue, we use the U.S. National Grid coordinate system. And a USNG coordinate is, is comprised of several parts. The first part is a grid zone. And a grid zone refers to a six degree longitude by eight degree latitude range. In most parts of the U.S., that represents a region of several states, just to give you an idea of about how big that is. Within that uh, grid zone, it's divided up into 100 kilometers squares. That is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. And there's a bunch of those within each grid zone, and they're identified by a pair of letters. One 100 kilometer square, typically in most parts of the U.S., covers several counties. So just to give you an idea of about how big one of those is. And then within that, we have coordinates. The coordinates are specified in two parts. The first part is the easting, which represents a number of meters east of a reference point. And that's followed by the northing, which represents a number of meters north of a reference point. We can specify the easting and northing with a varying number of digits. We always use the same number of digits for each one, so you'll have, always have an even, even number of digits in total. But for example, as I've shown here, if you use two digits for the easting and two digits for the northing, that specifies a 1,000 meter square or a one kilometer square. 
And that's perfectly reasonable for some purposes. We might not have a location more exact than that. If we add another digit, so we have three digits of each, then we specify a 100 meter square. And if we add another digit, so we have four digits of easting and four digits of northing, that specifies a 10 meter square. And that's the format we most commonly use for search and rescue. And, and in a search and rescue operation, when we give coordinates, often we will drop the grid zone and 100 kilometer square identifier during an operation. Because when we're talking to each other, we all know generally the area we're in. And so if we're relating coordinates to another search team, for example, usually we'll just give the digits and we'll usually give four digits of easting, four digits of northing. That's enough precision for most search and rescue purposes. It gets us within 10 meters, which is a, a 10 meter square is a, a little bit bigger than a two car garage. And more importantly, that's usually about as, as accurate as we can get with the devices we have. With a handheld GPS, you're not really going to get a location more accurate than about 10 meters. It will show you five digits of each, as I shown at the bottom. A GPS will show you coordinates to one meter precision, but it's really not that accurate, a small GPS. And in fact, if you look at the coordinates, they'll jump around quite a bit over time. So again, SAR coordinates is a pair of numbers. So in this case, I could relate a coordinate for search and rescue as 5226, 569, or 2. Another coordinate system that you'll encounter is the Military Grid Reference System, MGRS. And the most important thing to know about it is that for our practical purposes, it's really the same as USNG. As long as you're within the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, and as long as you're using one of our preferred uh, datum, either the datum uh, NAD83 or WGS84, these systems are interchangeable and the coordinates look the same. Now the MGRS has some other features. It's, it's usable worldwide and it has, for example, ways of dealing with coordinates near the North and South Pole where the grid lines tend to converge and, and we shift to kind of a different geometry there. But within the United States, practical purposes, MGRS is interchangeable with USNG. You may also encounter UTM coordinates, Universal Transverse Mercator coordinates. And the main thing to know when you're working in search and rescue is that in UTM, the zone, such as 16 Tango here, and the last five digits of the coordinates are going to be the same between UTM and USNG. And that's useful because we can convert between them easily enough if we're working within a local region. UTM is worldwide. Uh, it, it does uh, cover near the poles. It covers everywhere. And so it has some additional complexity. Uh, but for search and rescue, even though these two are derived, are closely related, we prefer the USNG coordinate system because that's the standard mandated by FEMA. Here are the USNG grid zones that cover most of the United States. And you can see typically, at least in most areas of the country, there's a few states within each zone, uh, obviously fewer or, or more depending on the size of the states, but this is how big they are. And for, for this uh, exercise, we're going to look at a specific area in Michigan near where I am. And so if you look here at zone 16 Tango, uh, that covers most of lower Michigan and most of uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. And you can see there's a red crosshair that I've marked in 1-6 Tango. And that's the area we're going to zoom in on. So let's, let's zoom in on to just this grid zone and take a closer look at it. Here's a view of grid zone 1-6 Tango that is further subdivided into 100 kilometer squares. And we're going to focus on 100 kilometer square Foxtrot November. So if we look in Foxtrot November, you can see my little crosshairs. They're partly covered up by the FN there, but you can see where they are. And we're now going to zoom in to that 100 kilometer square and take a closer look. Here is 100 kilometer square that we would identify as 16 Tango Foxtrot November. And you can see my little red crosshairs pretty much near the middle of, of this square. That's the area we're going to zoom in on. And uh, you can see that it's been divided into a 10 by 10 grid then of 10 kilometer squares. But I'm not going to zoom into one of those. I'm going to zoom into a region around my little area of interest here. And in this blue region, this is what's covered by the example map that I'm going to use for this presentation. So let's take a look at the area inside the blue rectangle. Here's a map that is typical of one we might use for search and rescue. You can see all the way in the lower left, it was made by Cal Topo. 
Uh, you can go to caltopo.com and for free you can generate your own maps like this. There's also SAR Topo, which is basically the same but has some additional features for search and rescue planning. So on this map there are a number of features of interest and let's go over them one by one. First take a look at the datum in the lower left corner. You can see that this map uses datum WGS84 which, as I said earlier, is equivalent to NAD83, and it's one of the, the preferred datum that we use for search and rescue purposes. Next, take a look in the lower left at the USNG zone. You can see that this map is within zone 16 Tango, Foxtrot November, as I illustrated in the previous slides. That's very important because if you're giving coordinates to someone who's looking at a completely different area, uh, then the numbers aren't going aren't to line up. So within zone 16 Tango, Foxtrot November, this grid, this map shows a grid of USNG coordinates. Along the top and bottom of the map, you'll see easting coordinates, and they're shown as 49, 50, 51, and so on. And the, each of these represents actually an increment of 1,000 meters. So the grid lines on this map are 1,000 meters apart. You can tell that by looking at the scale at the bottom, and I'll go into that in a moment. But easting then along the top and bottom shows meters to the east of a reference point. Similarly, northing shows meters north of a reference point along the left and right edges of the map. Connecting the coordinates along the left and right and top and bottom edges, the map has grid lines. And we'll be using these grid lines to help uh, locate points on this map and to locate coordinates with greater precision. At the bottom is a scale, and I put a question mark here. This map is shown at a scale of 1 to 25,000. And if you obtain this map and it's printed, if you obtain a map that's printed by a commercial map supplier, very likely that's going to be correct. If you obtain a map that's been photocopied or printed out on a laser printer, that may or may not be correct, depending on where the, whether the map is exactly at its original scale. So the scale is something to be taken with a grain of salt and checked. Uh, and you can check it by looking at the scale bars here. So the scale bars should be accurate on any map, even if it's been enlarged or reduced. And you can compare those using a, a, a scale such as the scale found on many compasses to confirm whether or not, in fact, the numerical scale is, in fact, right. For most purposes, rather than using the numerical scale, we'll be using these grid lines and we'll be using visual estimation to find coordinates on the map for, for this presentation. In the lower right, there's a declination arrow, and that shows the difference between true north and magnetic north. A compass will always point toward magnetic north, and that is rarely the same as true north. There is a difference. In this particular location, the compass will point six degrees to the west of true north. Now, we're not going to go into a compass in, in this presentation, but it's important to recognize that declination arrow and understand what it means, so that if you are using a compass, you can make an adjustment between the direction your compass points and true north shown on the map. You may encounter maps printed with coordinates that look like the ones I've shown in black in the upper left, and that's the format used to show UTM coordinates. UTM coordinates, as I've said, are directly related to USNG, and in fact the last five digits are the same, and that's important. So when they're printed like this, you might see them in either format or both of these formats on a given map. And the main thing to know is that the big numbers, the numbers shown much larger, uh, in this case 5-8 on the left and 4-9 at the top, those are going to be the same as the USNG coordinates that are shown on a map at this scale. So let's take a look at how we would relate some USNG coordinates onto an area of the map. So here I have example coordinates 1-6 Tango Foxtrot November 5-2-5-6. Because we have two digits in the easting and two digits in the northing, we know that that indicates a 1,000 meter square. That's the level of precision in these example coordinates. So let's find that square on the map. The first thing to check is that our map actually is shown within uh, area 16 Tango Foxtrot November. And you can see that in the lower left of this map. So yes, those coordinates should actually relate to the coordinates shown on this map. Next, take a look at the easting coordinate, 5, 2. And we can find that along the bottom and or the top of the map and find the 5, 2 indicated there. Uh, and so that's the line that we're going to be using. And then similarly, we find the northing along the left edge or the right edge of the map, in this case, 5, 6. 
And if we look at where those grid lines intersect, that specifies the lower left corner of a 1,000 meter square. It's always going to be the lower left corner. It's not the center, lower left corner. So these coordinates, 16 Tango Foxtrot November 5256, refer to this square area on this particular map. Now let's add another digit to specify a more precise location. So you can see now I've specified the coordinates as 522569. So I've added digits of precision. We start out the same way. We find the easting and the northing just like we did before and we find the 1,000 meter square within which these coordinates are placed. So that part's the same, but now we have an additional digit of precision. And so uh, one way to think about that is you could divide that 1,000 meter square into a 10 by 10 grid. You can get grid readers that will actually do that. You can lay the grid reader over this square and it'll place a grid like this right on the map for you. That works if you have a grid reader that is the same scale as your map, number one. So in this case, you'd need a 1 to 25,000 grid reader. And you, know, you may or may not have one that matches the scale of the map you're, you're handed. And number two, it only works if the map is printed actually to an accurate scale. So if the map has been photocopied and reduced or otherwise printed at a different scale, then the grid reader isn't going to work. For this presentation, and, and in general, I encourage you to locate coordinates visually first, at least. If you have a grid reader and want to get more exact locations, that's fine. But for starters, let's do it visually. So we place the 2 uh, along the lower left corner. 2 means 20% or 200 meters from the lower left. Then we can use the 9, which is the northing coordinate, and go up 90% or 900 meters from, from the bottom of our grid square. And that identifies a 100 meter square, as I've shown in green here. Now let's add yet another digit. So now we have four digits of easting and four digits of northing, and these are search and rescue coordinates. Once again, we locate our 1,000 meter square in the same way, but now we go over from the left 26%. 2,6 means 26% or 260 meters from the lower left corner. And then we go up 92% or 920 meters from the bottom. And that locates really a 10 meter square. And if you look really closely on the slide, I drew a little tiny red square there. But for practical purposes, this locates a point. Because the equipment we use and the techniques of plotting uh, grid coordinates on a map like this aren't really any more precise than that. And so for search and rescue, if we give a full eight digit coordinate, essentially that means a point. And, and we understand that our location accuracy is approximately within 10 meters. Now let's do an exercise. So suppose that you are on search team one and suppose that you're located at the trail intersection that I marked on this map in the purple circle. And suppose that incident command calls you on the radio, says search team one, report your position. At this point, I'm gonna invite you to stop the video and figure this out yourself. Work out using the techniques I just showed you. Where is this location? What are the SAR coordinates of this location on the map? So I suggest you pause the video, work that out, and then resume the video, and let's compare your answers to mine. Okay, first of all, we know that we're in this 1,000 meter square. Uh, just by looking at the map, we can, we can see which square we fall in. And based on that, we can look down at the bottom and find 5-2. We know that's going to be the first part of the easting coordinate that we're going to give. Next, to give more precise location, we measure over from the left side of the grid. And again, you can do this with a map reader, but I really encourage you to do it visually first every time. Because if you do it visually without relying on a device, then... If you use the device to get a more precise location and it's something totally different, that should, that should jog your mind and say, wait a minute, something's wrong. So learn to do this visually. It's a really useful skill. In this case, we will estimate how far over that is. And I estimate that's 50%, uh, which is 500 meters from the lower left corner of this square. And so our easting coordinate is going to be given by 5250. Then we do the same thing in the north direction. To get the northing, we find 5-7 over on the left. That's the lower left corner of our square. And then estimate the distance up from the bottom. I would estimate 22% uh, or 220 meters. And so I would give these coordinates as 5-2-5-0, 5-7-2-2. Two, two. 
Now, if you got a slightly different answer, that's perfectly understandable because I estimated these visually. Uh, if we used a grid reader or a scale, we might be able to get more precise, but for most purposes, estimating it visually is going to be adequate. Now let's do an exercise going in the opposite direction. Suppose that incident command calls you on the radio and says, Team 1, proceed to 5061-5677. Where are you going to go? Okay, so again, I invite you to stop the video, figure out your answer, work it out using the techniques I showed you, and then resume the video and check your answer against mine. The easting coordinate, 5061, begins with 50, and so we locate 50 along the bottom or top of the map. And similarly, 56 specifies the first part of our northing coordinate, so we can locate that along the left or right edge. And from those two, we can figure out the 1,000 meter square in which these coordinates will be found. So that gives us an approximate location. Now we need to use the other parts of the easting north northing to find our location more accurately. Starting with 6-1, that is 61%, or 610 meters from the, from the left edge of our square. And then 7-7 seven, seven of the northing specifies 77% up from the bottom, uh, or 770 meters. And so the location we're being directed to is this corner uh, marked on the trail here. Hopefully you found that location too, or a point very close to it. Uh, if not, maybe try again. <laughs> so, uh, that's, so that shows you how to go both directions. Either given a point on the map, you can now find the coordinates, or given coordinates, you can find the point on the map. Now let's talk about topography, the topographic features shown on the map. We don't always have a topographic map when we're doing search and rescue. It depends on the situation. We might have a map that doesn't show any, or we might be searching in a cornfield that's just all flat and doesn't really have any interesting topography. But usually we'll have a map with topographic features. So let's look at the features on, on this map as an example. First of all, the, probably the most obvious feature of a topographical map are the contour lines. Each line is a line of constant elevation. So if you were to walk along the side of a hill without going up or down, but staying at the same elevation as you walk along, you'd be walking along a contour line. And on this map, you can see that contour lines are far apart in some areas and close together in others. And any place they're close together, when they're very dense, that indicates a very steep slope. Areas where they're far apart, it's going to be relatively flat land. You'll also notice numbers printed on the contours. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm showing you three numbers, 680, 720, 760. And those are elevation. And in most uh, situations for us, most maps we use, it's going to be printed in feet above sea level. Obviously, it could be metric, but normally we use feet because that's usually how our, our GPSs are set up. So, in this particular case, these contours, these heavy index contours, that is the heavy ones that have the numbers, are 40 feet apart in elevation. I go from 680 to 720 to 760, a change of 40 feet each time. And in between those heavy index contours are three thinner contours. So I have three contours in between means I have four intervals in between the contours going from one index contour to the next. So I have a change of 40 feet and I have four intervals. That means it's 10 feet of elevation change between each of the contour lines. Another feature that you'll often see on topographical maps are loops. It's very common to see sort of these concentric rings and usually those are hills. They can be depressions and if it is a depression, if you look closely on the map, there'll be little tick marks pointing inward to indicate that this is actually a hole. But most of the time, they're going to be hills. Partly that's just how dirt works. But also, especially in lower Michigan, when we do have depressions, they tend to fill up with water and we call those lakes. So most of the time, loops are going to be hills. You'll also see these V-shaped features very commonly on topographic maps. And when you look, when you see the V-shaped if you look at the direction they're pointing, if that goes from an area of lower elevation to an area of higher elevation, which you can determine by looking at those index contours that have the elevation numbers, that means a valley. So when the Vs point toward a higher elevation, the Vs point upward, that means a valley. If you see V shapes going downward from higher to lower elevations, that's called a spur. It's like a ridge that falls off. Very often these occur together. And so in this map, we're seeing a valley uh, with a spur sort of jutting out into it. 
So let's do an exercise involving contour lines. Suppose you are located in the center of the magenta circle that I've drawn here. What is your altitude above sea level at that point? Uh, at this point, again, I invite you to pause the video, work out your answer, and then resume the video and compare it with mine. So to find your elevation, you need to find some nearby index contour lines that have elevations printed. And you can see the one just to the south of the location is marked as 720 feet above sea level. So we know that's our elevation is going to be close to that, but we need to find an additional elevation to help us out. The next contour line, sort of up and to the left of this position, it's kind of hard to see the elevation printed over to the left of it because it got covered up by a road. And so if you need to find the elevation of an index contour, sometimes you need to follow it around the map a fairly long distance. So in this case, you have to follow that contour around until you find the 680. And now you can, now you can tell that that contour line is at 680 feet above sea level. So we know that we're in between these two locations and obviously pretty close to 680. But if we want to try to get an exact location, if you look closely, you can see that, as I showed before, in between these, with a 40-foot span, there are four contour intervals. And our location is actually within that first interval. It's in between the 680 and the next higher contour. And so I would say the elevation of this point is 685 feet above sea level. So as another exercise, suppose you were located at that point, how would you describe your surroundings? If you're standing there, what things could you say about the things that you would see around you? Again, I invite you to pause the video and do the exercise. Try and write down four or five things that you would see if you were standing at that point based on the topographic features shown on the map. The first thing we might observe is that this is a valley. You can see the V-shaped features are pointing from an area of lower elevation to an area of high elevation. And so that represents a valley, as I said earlier. Okay. We can also see that the valley slopes. We can see the direction of the slope. It slopes down toward the northwest and it slopes up to the southeast. Now, if you're in a situation where you're trying to relate where you are to some point on the map, maybe you don't have a GPS and you're trying to determine where you are, well, one thing you can look for is a valley sloping in that direction. So that's one directional clue uh, to help you locate your position. What else can you see? Well, there's a little side valley here. That's kind of a distinctive feature. Uh, going off to the southwest, there's a little side valley uh, coming off of the main valley. Again, you can tell that that is a valley because the V shapes point toward higher elevations. It's not a spur, it's a valley coming off to the side. Another thing that kind of jumps out is that there's a very, very steep slope, unusually so for this map, to the northeast. So if you were standing at this valley floor, it looks like the floor of the valley is fairly flat, but immediately to the northeast there'd be a real steep slope that would probably be difficult to climb, it's so steep. So this is just an example of how you can relate various features, and if you find yourself out in the woods, and you might, uh, you know, you're trying to find out where you are on a map, if you walk to a location that has some really distinctive features like this, you may be able to use that information to associate the terrain around you to a point on the map. And terrain association is an important navigational technique because it, uh, it can help you find your location even if you don't have a compass or a GPS or if one of your devices has failed. And it can also confirm your location. So if you, if you think you know where you are, uh, you think you know the coordinates, etc., you think you know compass direction, you can look at features like this and look at your surroundings to help confirm that, double check that your location actually is where you think it is. So at this point, you should understand what a map datum is and why it's very important that if you're communicating coordinates or using coordinates between a GPS and a map, that in fact the same map datum is in use or an equivalent one like NAD83 and WGS84. You should be able to understand and explain the U.S. National Grid coordinate system. What it means when you see the different parts, you should understand grid zones, 100 kilometer squares, and coordinates within them. You should be able to relate the digits in a set of USNG coordinates to how much precision we have. So, for example, with search and rescue coordinates, we have four digits of easting, four digits of northing. That gives us a precision of 10 meters. You should be able to look at a point on a map 
and get the USNG coordinates from that point. And you should be able to go in the other direction. Given coordinates, you should be able to find the corresponding point on a map. And finally, you should be able to look at your surroundings and relate those surroundings, perhaps out in the woods, to features that you would see on a topographic map. Or look at a topographic map and read the topographic features and know what you should be seeing if, you, if you're actually in that location. Well, that wraps up this short course on using maps, USNG coordinates, and topography for search and rescue purposes. And I hope you found this useful.